Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and in this episode of Computer Organization Design, we're going to talk about the power wall. Now in this section of the book, uh, we're going to first go over um, a chart of Intel microprocessors over 30 years, showing both uh, clock rate and power trends over time. Right, so as we can see over here, right, so keep in mind that this is a uh, log scaled graph uh, in terms of clock rate, right, so clock rate will be in blue, right, and this is just a normal uh, linear scale. Uh, for power, which is in black. So as we can see with this um, exponential increase in power, right, because this is log scale, we got a linear increase in power, right? So, uh, and especially during this time between 1993 and around 2004, we saw both a massive increase in clock rate, uh, but also a fairly significant increase uh, in power uh, in terms of watts as well, right? So the reason these things grow together is because they're correlated and the reason for the recent slowing that we can see, you know, post 2004, where we basically have no increase in frequency and even a decrease in some cases, uh, and a decrease in power, is because we run into a problem, which is a practical power, uh, a practical power limit for cooling and uh, commodity microprocessors. Right. So you know, power provides limits to what we can cool, of course. Um, you know. The really valuable resource, though, is energy, right? So if you're talking about something like a mobile phone, uh, what you're really caring about is how long you can make that mobile phone last, right? So if you have a phone that only lasts for 30 minutes, it's not much use to you. And likewise, when you have these giant, you know, data center scale computers and warehouse scale computers, uh, when you talk about, you know, minor decreases, you know, per CPU power wise, you know, when you've got 100,000 servers, you know, this winds up being a huge amount of power that you can save overall uh, once you're doing things like this at scale, right? So, uh, so one thing that we'll find out here is that just measuring things in terms of, uh, you know, like in performance, how we saw that MIPS or millions of instructions per second is, you know, not quite a safe evaluation. Uh, the metric joules is a better measure uh, than a power rate like watts, uh, which is just joules per second, right? So first we need to talk about when we're talking about energy, we need to talk about, you know, why the power, you know, why this power wall kind of came about. And it all comes back to the, you know, technology that we use for integrated circuits, which is called CMOS or complementary metal oxide semiconductors. Now we're not going to go in depth into semiconductors, but what you should know is that uh, the dynamic energy, which is you can think of as your switching energy, so you know going from a zero to a one to a zero, or a one to a zero to a one, right? Uh, this energy is proportional to the capacitive load uh, times the voltage uh, squared, right? So uh, if you just want you know a single transition, zero to a one or one to a zero, we could just cut this in half, right? So um, the power required per transistor is just going to be a product of energy of a transition and the frequency of transitions. So in this case, one transition, so one half that original value, capacitive load times voltage squared, and then we just multiply by how fast we're switching it or the frequency switched. Now here, uh, the frequency switched um, in our computers, it's going to be a function of clock rate. Now, one thing we haven't discussed is the capacitive load, and this is just going to be uh, related to um, you know, a number of things dealing with the physical side. Uh, which would be the number of transistors connected to the output called the fan out. So do we have to drive multiple uh, a signal in multiple different directions to different inputs? Uh, so that's what fan out is. And then also the technology which determines the capacitance of both the wires and the transistors. So you know, what are we having to drive as well as uh, you know, the actual technology itself? So you know, one thing that you know, might be a little surprising though is you know, we already saw right here that the power, um, how are we able to increase the frequency so much? Uh, but the power didn't increase nearly as quickly, right? And the reason why the power didn't increase nearly as quickly, right? So uh, the reason why I say that is, you know, remember this is a, a clock rate, which is, um, you know, this you know, exponential scaling, right? So this is, this is uh, log scaled. Um, access and this power over here is just you know an unaltered just linear scale so how are we able to increase the frequency so much uh, and this comes back to the fact that we're able to lower the voltage at the same time so you know you know 
even though we're able to, you know, a clock rate grew by a factor of a thousand and power increased by only a factor of 30, uh, we can just lower the voltage, right? And this is what we could do for quite a while until very recent, uh, until relatively recently, I should say. Uh, and this was a common, you know, a common technique uh, for new generations of technology, right? And so voltage would be, you know, reduced by 15% per generation. And so this led to in about 20 years going from about five volts uh, to being around one volt, right? And this is why power only increased 30 times because this voltage squared term, we are able to, you know, keep making it smaller and smaller, and smaller. Uh, and it's also a squared term, right? Um, and then we were able to increase the frequency by a huge amount, right? So um, we should also talk about you know, relative power a little bit. So, you know, let's think about, you know, if we were to have a new, you know, more simple process technology or a, sim or a more simple processor that has, you know, 85% the capacitive load of a more complex older processor. And then let's say that we can also tune the voltage a little bit. Uh, and then we can also, um, we can also shrink the frequency as well. So how would this impact dynamic power or switching power? Well, you know, similar to like our performance equations, we'll just put the P new over uh, the power old, right? Uh, so then we'll just scale uh, this power, power equation, which will be the capacitive load, voltage squared, and frequency switch, but these will all be scaled by 0 0.85. Now, a simplification we can do is that, you know, all of, all of these things, capacitive load, you know, these will end up canceling out. And so what we'll be left with is, you know, 0 0.85 times 0 0.85 squared times 0 0.85, right? Which just gives us 0 0.85 to the fourth, a little hard to read that there, which is roughly equal to 0 0.52. So if we're able to scale each of these things by about 15%, or so, um, we end up getting, you know, this power ratio of new over old being about half. So the new processor is only gonna use about half the power of the old processor, right? So, you know, this idea of scaling voltage seems like a great idea. Why don't we just keep doing it? Uh, well, the problem is um, it's the end of something called Dinard scaling, which isn't really covered in this book. Um, but if you're more interested in that, feel free to look up Dinard scaling. Um, now, the problem is that lowering the voltage uh, makes the transistors too leaky. And what we mean here is that, um, you know, we were just talking about dynamic power, which is a power related to switching, but there's also a power uh, that the transistor will dissipate just by sitting there, right? And it turns out that when you, uh, when you start decreasing the voltage, right, your transistors uh, tend to leak more. And so, you know, nowadays, uh, about 40% of the power consumption, you know, in server chips is actually due to leakage, not actually due to dynamic power. So, um, you know, if we keep scaling the voltage lower and lower, you know, this leakage, uh, this, this leaking and this power due to leakage that, you know, we're just losing doing nothing, uh, this just becomes kind of unwieldy, right? Because we're constantly paying that cost. So, you know, how do we address this problem, right? So, uh, and, you know, the power problem. So one of the problems is of course, you know, you make transistors smaller, you're packing more of them into a certain space. Um, but this is, you know, really condensing your power. And so you're gonna have, you know, a heating problem, right? So there's a number of, you know, uh, you know, things like heat sinks and ways that we, you know, cool devices. Uh, there's also more, you know, complex techniques in terms of what's going on inside the chip itself. Uh, there's this idea of something called dark silicon where you can, uh, uh, you can't, you know, effectively power everything at the same time. So you can shut down parts of the processor uh, that aren't doing anything uh, at that given moment. Uh, and But there's also going to be a cost you know, to bringing those back up. So there's a lot of trade-offs involved in these power optimizations. Um, so although there are more expensive ways to cool chips um, and thereby raise their power uh, to say 300 watts, these techniques are generally too costly for personal computers uh, and even servers, not to mention personal uh, mobile devices. So, you know, this isn't to say that it's impossible, you know, to say increase power to solve some of these problems that we get from decreasing power. Um, this is just saying that, you know, from a cost perspective, you know, we have to think about things at scale a lot of times, right? And so, you know, if your personal computing gets too expensive, people just aren't going to buy that product. And likewise, if it becomes too expensive to run a data center, 
you know, people just aren't going to go with those parts in their data center. So there's a number of things that, you know, this has affected, right? So since computer designers slammed into the power wall, they've needed a new way forward. Uh, they chose a different path from the way uh, they designed microprocessors for the first 30 years, right? And so in the next video, we'll go over this, this section 1.8, the sea of change, the switch from uniprocessors to multiprocessors. So, you know, you may be familiar with now this idea of, you know, multiple core and I've got to get more cores and how many cores do I have? Uh, well, a lot of this came about because, you know, we kept making bigger and bigger chips, even though, um, you know, we couldn't, uh, to combat the fact that we couldn't uh, scale the frequency up as much. And likewise, it was a lot harder to, you know, make the transistors that much smaller. All right, but that's going to do it for this episode. Feel free to check out any of my other stuff on github.com slash coffee before arch. We've got all kinds of stuff here, you know, dealing with C++ programming, CUDA programming, Python programming and parallel programming in C++. Just as, as an example, we'll go to say CUDA programming and let's look at, you know, why don't we look at cache tile matrix multiplication, right? So feel free to download any of this code, play around with it. And let me know if you have any suggestions for any topics you would like covered in, you know, a computer science or computer engineering area in the future. But that's going to do it for today. I'm Nick and I hope you have a nice day.